numbers. We live by numbers. We track and count and measure everything. And sometimes we think the only numbers that really matter are the big ones. But it's the single digits that make the difference. The Bible says that heaven rejoices with the number one. Yeah, heaven rejoices each time even one person comes to know Jesus. We pastors dream about big numbers, and we should. But a daily focus on one meaningful interaction for Christ, that's the true difference maker. One friend, one family member, one coworker, one person at a time. We want to see God move in our nation like we have never seen before, but it all starts with one. I've got my one, and now I'm challenging you and your church to join us and to find yours. Because ultimately, the only number that really matters is one. Who's your one? That was a message from J.D. Greer, who is the pastor of Summit Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's also the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He, along with many others, have been challenging us over this past year uh, to recognize the importance of seeing one person that you can impact for the kingdom of God. To be able to know that there's one person out there that God might have in your path that you can touch in some way so that they may come to an understanding of what Jesus has done for them and they too might understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again and you, you and I can have life when we accept what he has done for us. We have been talking over the past weeks about the opportunity of what it is to know who's your one. We've asked you to take prayer guides, to take bookmarks, to concentrate and pray for one person or pray for that person that God has laid on your heart to be able to know there's an opportunity, there's a time where you might be able to share something. Now, some of us are going to be uncomfortable with this because it's out of our normal thing to be able to know that we're supposed to share what Jesus has done for us with other people. Paul, I can't do that. Paul, that's not my gift. <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> Paul, that's just too much, you know, too many people. I can't do this kind of stuff. But every single one of us have been given a responsibility to share what Jesus has done for us. And this morning, what I want you and I to understand is the value of what that one really is. The value of one. Now think about this with me. <clears throat> what is so significant about one? Think of one penny. You know, I told the early service, an interesting thing when I go shopping, and I don't like to shop unless I'm shopping for myself, of course. Then I can, you know, just go. And usually I do that methodical shopping. I know what I'm getting. I go, I get, I leave. I don't have to look at everything, everywhere, at every store, at every possible opportunity. I just know. But the interesting thing about this is when I go into stores, I'm amazed at these prices. $9.99. In my book, that's 10 bucks. Oh, no, but it's $9.99. That's one penny. It's amazing when we kind of consider $4.97. Why don't we just say 5 bucks? Come on, folks. What's three pennies? And it doesn't take long for, again, for you to go somewhere where there's not the resources that we have. I mean, when the average daily wage is less than $10, because that's what it is in Haiti for most people, the average is 5 to $8 a day that they may make. You know, and it's an amazing thing. Pennies count. What's the value of one? What's the value of one penny? What's the value of one dollar? What's the value of one person? The Bible tells us this idea of the value of one thing. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 45, it says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. One pearl. Now, you may think pearls today, man, that's nothing. But back then, pearls were of great value because... It was a very dangerous thing to gather pearls. I mean, they didn't have the scuba gear that we do today where they can go down and get as many pearls as they want to. A lot of times, folks went down, but they never came back up because they were trying to get that one pearl. So to find a pearl 
Jesus uses this analogy to say there is great value in one. There's great value in you. You're valuable. I'm valuable. The people around us are valuable. But do we really understand what that value is? The value of one. Now, this particular merchant found that one pearl and sold everything so that he could buy the one pearl. He had found the one. Now, many scholars believe that this is an analogy about the understanding of Jesus himself, about salvation experience. But it's the idea of the value of what one is when we find that. And folks, I want you to know the value of what Jesus has given us and the value of other people. Do you remember when you became one? When you became a child of God? When you, at that moment in your life, understood that you needed Jesus in your life and you prayed and said, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that Jesus died for my sins and I want him to be a part of my life and I want to give my life to him. I want Jesus as my Savior. Do you remember that day when in your life you made that choice to be able to say, I'm going to surrender all my life to Jesus? Do you remember the day and the emotion that you might have had, the excitement that you had, those around you that rejoiced with you? Do you remember that moment? You may not be able to go back and remember all of that. You just know for sure that you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that's a decision that affects your eternity. And you may know that. But what about maybe those spiritual benchmarks in your life, those moments in your life where you've gone through a crisis or a trouble or something exciting and you know God did something on that day in my life. God did something amazing. He helped me to understand because let me tell you, as a seven-year-old, when I gave my life to Jesus, I may not have understood everything. In fact, I know I didn't understand everything about Jesus. But as I grew in my understanding, I had those aha moments. And I remember what it was like in those moments. Aha! This is what God's Word says. This is what Jesus means. This is what the Apostle Paul was saying. And we have those moments in our life. Do you remember those moments in your life when your life was changed in the excitement of what it was like that something incredible happened, that God did something in your life. Do you remember what it was like to become a one? The Bible is full of stories and illustrations about this very fact. In fact, in Luke chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, you can turn. We're going to look at some stories in there. Luke chapter 15 Starting in verse 1. Open your Bible, open your app, or follow along with me on the screen. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, being Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. In verse 4. What man of you, having a hundred sheep... If he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on its shoulder, on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together all of his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost." Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. There is value in finding the one. For us, hopefully today, you can say that you have found Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have found the one who can change your life forever. You have found Jesus who can take all of your sins, nailed it to the cross when he was nailed on the cross, died, buried, and rose again so that you and I can have a new life. I hope and pray that you have experienced Jesus Christ in your life so that you can say you are the one. The one that he died for. The one that he went through all of that for. The one that your very purpose of living on this earth is to experience a redeemed relationship with Jesus Christ and to be able to be the light 
in the darkness. I pray and hope that you have that one experience. But these stories give us an illustration of what it was like for one. To have one sheep that is lost and to go out and to seek. To have one coin that is lost and to diligently search until you find it, the one. You know, that gives a whole lot of value upon one. But let me tell you here today that you are value. Do you know that you are valuable? What is the value of you? Are you as valuable as the one pearl that you had, the merchant sold everything to go get? Are you as valuable as the sheep that the other 99 would be left so that you could be found? Are you as valuable as the coin to search everywhere until it is found? Let me tell you, you are valuable because I know that Jesus died for you. You are valuable. And if you and I are valuable, valuable enough for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, then what is it to say about the one that you know does not know Jesus? The one that you come across every single day that you worry about because their life is spiraling out of control. The one that you're going to pass in the hallway at school that you know is doing things that would upset everybody and God himself because of the choices that we're making. Or the one that is forgotten, that's talked about, that's left aside, that has no one to walk with them, no one to sit with them, no one to help them. The one. What is the value of one? You see, one of the things that I have understood about this whole campaign is I've gone through the prayer guide myself and I'm praying for um, for the one, I actually have two names that I keep writing in that prayer guide every single day to remind me of the opportunities and praying that God would soften their heart because he hasn't so far. But it's the two names that I'm praying for because I know they are valuable to God himself enough that Jesus died for them just as he died for me. And I hope that you will realize because it has changed my perspective of who people are the people that I see, so much that I keep coming across this word, this one factor in all of this thing that I must do in my own life, and I'm praying that you do also. And that's the word to be intentional. If we say that people are valuable, if you say that I am valuable, then you're going to take intention in your life. You're going to exercise. You're going to eat well. Try to eat well. You're going to get enough rest. You're going to do things in your life to make sure that you're safe because you're taking intention upon your own life. But what about, church, what about that one, the one that you know may die and go to hell and never experience the hope, never know what true love is really like, never know what it's like to worship a God who created them for the purpose of living what about that one? Intentional is a word that I keep coming across. So how can we be intentional in all the things that we have? <clears throat> I'm just going to challenge you today. As many of you are going to be starting schools, regardless of your age, there is something that you can do and be intentional about to touch someone, to plant a seed, to encourage, to uplift Maybe that one person that you see is just isolated, alone. And yeah, we can say, well, maybe that's just the way they want to be. But you know what? Jesus didn't ask questions. He just died on the cross. Jesus didn't ask what risk would it take. He just died for you and me. So we shouldn't necessarily ask, do they want it? Do they need it? We should just be intentional. And if you can just pick out one person, one person every single day that you may encourage, that you may... In fact, in between services, someone was telling me they were buying furniture and they just happened to make a comment about a country that this person was from and it just brought joy into their hearts that they were so thankful. It changed their perspective and attitude for the whole day. One thing that we could say to somebody and we'd be intentional about it. Because you see, God's word tells us that we, we are the light in this darkness that we see every day. In 2 
Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The very light that it talks about is the light that God spoke in Genesis at creation. And that light, Paul says, now shines in our hearts that we are to be light in the darkness if we are intentional about sharing what great things that we know about Jesus. And we shouldn't be ashamed of it. Paul says also in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone. You know, I don't have to have the great ability. You don't have to have ability. What did I say a couple of weeks ago? You just have to be available. God is the one. His gospel is the power to save somebody. You don't have to worry about saving somebody. You just have to point them to Jesus. You don't, you don't have to have the right words. You just have to say, ask Jesus to do the work. Why are we praying for people that God would do a work in their life? I'm not asking you to go out and to evangelize and to preach at people. I'm just asking you to pray for that one person that God would bring into your life that maybe, just maybe, you could say something that would point them to Jesus. So how do we be intentional? Two things I want to share with you. <coughs> the first one is have a plan and have a celebration. <laughs> Have a plan, have a celebration. Be intentional. If you have a plan, that means that you have a purpose, a desire, an intention for what you're doing, a direction. You have a mission. We've talked about that. Part of this whole idea of the Who's Your One campaign is to know that you are on mission for God. You and I have a responsibility to share what we have. If we're not sharing, then that means we're hoarding. Where in the Bible does it say we're supposed to hoard what Jesus has given us? He said, no, you're, you're the light. The same light. When Jesus spoke the words to get rid of the darkness, when he brought light at creation, when he said, let there be light, boop, there was light. There's a lot of times, you know, in Haiti, I was thinking, let there be AC, let there be AC. It didn't happen. But I was praying it. <laughs> when you go Tuesday, you're going to be praying that the AC works in every classroom. But sometimes all we need to do is just to pray, to have a plan, but to have a celebration. Turn with me into John chapter 1. I want to share with you something that happened to the disciples. And it was something about being intentional, having a plan, and also celebrating what God has done. Because that's what we need to do. Have a plan, have a celebration. If I'm going to be intentional, I'm going to have a plan. And then once I see that plan at work, I'm going to celebrate. Let me tell you, I'm going to celebrate. This morning we're celebrating. Did you not know that we're celebrating? We are celebrating a God who loves us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross so that we might experience new life, so that we don't have to come in here dead. I'm glad none of you are dead. (laughs) Really, I'm glad. I'm glad you have life. But I want you to have the life that Jesus offers, not just the life that you and I tend to run to sometimes. In John chapter 1, verse 43, it says this, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I told the early service, kind of like saying, Can anything good come out of Jefferson County? But then in... Verse 46, Philip said to him, Nathaniel, come and see. Now, those are two very important words that I want us to understand. Because when we're talking about the value of other people, the value of the people that you are going to come across in your day, these are important words because sometimes people won't accept what we have to say. In fact, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Who is this Jesus? But we know from this story Philip said, come and see, come and check it out, come and look, come and understand what I have seen. So in verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and he said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now right there I would have said, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, because Jesus knows everything. I'm sorry to say, Jesus knows Jesus knows all the good and the bad. Jesus knows. And in verse 49, Nathaniel answered this and said, Rabbi, teacher, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You see, that's the celebration. 
You see, the amazing thing about it is when Philip had the plan, he found Nathaniel. Why? Because he wanted Nathaniel to understand who Jesus really was. We have found him, the one who was promised. Let me ask you this. Not that any of us would be guilty of this, but I just know we're in the flesh. So let's talk a little bit in the flesh. If somebody said, I found the winning ticket to the lottery, what would you do? Ooh, give me. <laughs> can I have that? Why don't you share? Let's find it together so we can share all this kind of stuff. Immediately, it would just cause us to want something also. When Philip found the true Messiah, the Son of God, he said, Nathaniel, come and see this great thing. How many of us value other people so much that we want them to experience the same thing that we do? I'm not even going to get into talking about social media and how much we post and, and, and Snapchat about the things that we experience in life. But what about the value of Jesus Christ? How excited do we get about that? How intentional are we about sharing those things in our life? Even just the little things. The little things in the hallway of saying, hello, have a good day. Man, that could change somebody's perspective. Why? Because they may be on the brink of giving up. They may be suffering with stuff that you have no idea. They may be carrying weight and baggage in their backpack that none of us should ever be able or, or should have to bear. But you see, we need to have a plan and to celebrate. Three things I want to share with you. Look for one. Come and see and rejoice. Remember those words. Circle those words. Highlight those words. Look for one. Come and see, rejoice. Philip found Nathaniel because he had the plan to look for one. And then even when Nathaniel questioned, Philip said, come check it out. Just check it out. Just come and see. How many times do we cross somebody if we have the intentional plan to be able to say, I'm going to encourage somebody today. And then when we say, hey, listen, this is going to be a great day. It's an amazing thing that happens. Come and see. Come and see. Or maybe, maybe... Just maybe, if we pray that God will give us an opportunity, we could even say, hey, listen, let me tell you about what God did in my life this summer. Hey, let me tell you what happened at camp. Hey, let me tell you about one of the changes I'm doing from here on out. Hey, let me tell you what's going to be different. Hey, let me tell you something I realized about God. Hey, let me tell you, did you check out that sunrise this morning? No, I was sleeping. Well, I took a picture. Let me show you. Come and see. Come and see. How many of us lose opportunities because we don't look for the one? But yet Jesus looked for us. And every time that we get together and we sing these songs and we're reminded, every time we open God's word and we read of the great things of his word and the guidance that he gives us and the wisdom that's in here of how to live, it's like saying, come and see, come and see, and then rejoice. You are the son of God. Nathaniel said, you are the one. Some of you may be saying, I can't do all that stuff, Paul. I can't, I can't do that. I can't risk too much. I don't, I'm not old enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not mature enough. Let me remind you of a story of a little boy in John chapter 6. This is a great story about Jesus and the disciples and all the crowd. And in verse 5 of John chapter 6, it says, lifting up his eyes, then and seeing the large crowd come towards him, Jesus said to Philip, <laughs> Where are we to buy all the bread so that we can feed these people? And he said this to test him because he knew what he was going to do. You know, Jesus has a way of knowing what's going to happen. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough to feed them. And one of his disciples, Andrew, said to him, There is a boy here with five loaves and two fish. A boy that was available. And we know the rest of the story because Jesus said, Bring him here. Have everybody sit down, and we know that Jesus took care of all the needs. Jesus did the miracle. The boy just happened to be there. How many of us may just be like that boy where we just kind of say, okay, I'm here. What are you going to do, God? How many of us are praying that maybe we are like the boy, and we just happen to be at the right place at the right time, and God can take control? How do we be intentional? There's a couple of things I just want to share with you as we come to a close for one, I always want to remind you of the Roman road. 
four simple verses that I use a lot of times that just help explain what Jesus did for me because I was a sinner dying going to hell. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I knew that there was something that my sins couldn't do for me that Jesus had to do for me because the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But in all the things that I've done and tried in my life, I had to accept the fact that God loves me regardless of what I've done, regardless of who I think I am or how bad I am or how wayward I am. God loves me, Romans 5, 8, because he showed it to me through Jesus. And Romans 10, 9 says that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, then I shall be saved. So you see, my story of salvation is really the Roman road. So I use that a lot of times. I encourage you to memorize these verses. Mark them in your Bible. Write them down. Because they're just simple scripture to back up what happened to me when I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Now, here's another tool that you can use. The Life Conversation Guide. In fact, there are tracks, I call these tracks, little booklets that talk about using three circles, about our brokenness, about God's design, our brokenness, and God's, uh, the gospel, which is the redemption of Jesus Christ. Now, an easy way to do this, you can actually, there's an app. You can go to your phone, go to your app store, Google store, whatever it is, type in Life Conversation Guide, and you'll come up with this app. And in the app... You, it's a video that you can actually play because you know how we are. Sometimes we love to share videos, good and bad. Mm -hmm. We love to share videos. Hey, have you checked this out? And we could do that, push, push, play. And what it does, it goes through that gospel presentation of the three circles. Or you could actually go through and swipe page by page and lead somebody through that. But it's really cool because you can have it on your phone. And we know we are never anywhere without our phones, even in Haiti. Because they have fiber optic. We don't, but they do. But this is a great tool to be able to use for that moment because we see the value in one. That one opportunity where we can talk with someone to be able to share something about Jesus Christ with them. And maybe, just maybe, God is preparing their heart to be able to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they too may be able to understand this love that God has given us and the salvation and the new life that we have had. What a great feeling it is to be able to sit down with someone and to lead them through and to say, Do you understand what Jesus did for you? And for them to say, he died for my sins. Celebrate, rejoice for the one that is found. Romans 10 says this, 10, 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How valuable is the one? And my question this morning is, are you the one? Are you the one to take up the challenge that God has given all of us to share? Are you the one that's going to be intentional and have a plan about the great things that God may have in store for you this year? Are you the one that can possibly change one? Matthew 28, 19, go, therefore, and make disciples. Jesus said, this is what you are to do, to make disciples. So you see, what we need to do, church, is say, hey, come and see. Come and see as we go and tell. Because Jesus died for you so that you may be able to share with one. Let's pray.